Hello and welcome to Super Wild Card Weekend here on the X's and O's with Doug Farrar and Greg Cosell. I, of course, am Doug Farrar of Touchdown Wire and USA Today Sports Media Group. And the gentleman over there in the natty NFL Films hoodie, which I just love, is Greg Cosell of ESPN's NFL, ESPN NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. Greg has a lot of hats that he wears, although he's not wearing a hat right now. Greg, it's Super Wild Card Weekend in bulk and we have a lot to discuss, so let's just get right the heck into it. Uh, Browns at Texans. Uh, now, the Browns have played single high on 64% of their snaps, the NFL's highest rate. C.J. Stroud, and there are a lot of different iterations of that, but sure. C.J. Stroud, yeah. C.J. Stroud this year against cover one and cover three, 141 of 228 for 2,054 yards, uh, 11 touchdowns, one interception, and a pass rating of 105.4. Only Dak Prescott and Lamar Jackson have higher pass rating against middle-of-the-field closed coverage this season. Stroud is great at challenging single high with crossers underneath and quick to intermediate out routes to displace cornerbacks playing the numbers, especially to Nico Collins. Those outs have been just devastating. Um, now, these two teams faced off in Week 16. Browns won 36-22. Stroud is out with a concussion, so it was Davis Mills and Case Keenum. Um what what you've seen from and when we talk about the Browns single high specifically, it's a lot of invert two, it's a lot of invert one, it's a lot of invert three. So when we get into what Stroud will be facing, which he may not have faced before to this degree, how Jim Schwartz inverting his coverage affects what you see on the field if you're a quarterback. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll do a d- decent amount of that um, because playing, you know, one thing. I guess the way I'd answer that is one thing you see when you watch Stroud. And, and it's one reason that their pass game is so effective and he's been so good as a rookie quarterback is because he works outside the numbers at the short intermediate levels, especially to the wide side of the field. And you don't see that a lot in the NFL. Uh, so that's one reason he's been effective. It's, it expands the Texans passing game. Um, so if you're just playing kind of single high, whether it's man or cover three, you know, he can work outside the numbers well. So I think what you'll likely see from Jim Schwartz is just what you said, is you'll see a little more of muddying the look with with um, those sort of cover three inverts, those cover two inverts, those things where you're there's just a little uncertainty when you take the snap of the ball. Now, to Stroud's credit, he's been very good for a rookie quarterback at immediately processing late rotation in coverage um, yes. but obviously we're now in the playoffs so you just don't know but his his what he's done this year has indicated that he can do that well um right. so yeah so i think that's that in the past game that's what this game comes down to he will get a lot of single high he'll work outside the numbers he'll work on on the crossers to collins collins can run away from man coverage um and uh but you'll also get a lot of, of late rotation with some sort of hybrid coverage looks that he quite hasn't seen that way before. Yeah, although it's like we discussed the Vikings defense, uh, Jordan Love and all that, when it was at the play we discussed where the Vikings were in single high, but you kind of knew what they were going to move to because they you have a whole season of tendencies now. Right. So even, you know, I think Stroud will think, and, and, you know, right or wrong to whatever degree, yeah, they're in two, but eventually they're going to flip to one because that's kind of who they are. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, when you first see all that movement, that might be a little different than what you've seen based on where guys are coming from and, and moving to, you know, it, we'll see. But I mean, he's been, it, it has not been a problem for him this year in his ability to react to late rotation. He's been able to just see it instantly, stay within the, the structure and the timing of the play call and get the ball out. Yeah, he, he looks very much like he's been in the NFL for five years. It's tremendously impressive. So these two teams faced off, as I said, in Week 16. Browns won 36-22. It was Davis Mills and Case Keenum because Stroud was out with a concussion. Joe Flacco had several explosive plays in that game, 27-42 to for 368, three touchdowns. He also had two interceptions, which is the Joe Flacco experience because he's an aggressive thrower. I mean, he's like, right. I'm going for it. Uh, the second interception came with five seconds left in the first half, so that was Hail Mary defense. But the first one with 139 left in the first half was on a slot vertical route to Marquise Goodwin, where Flacco's throw hung up a bit, and safety DeAndre Houston Carson came down with it. Flacco has eight interceptions since his comeback. Four have come on vertical routes from the slot, so that's something to watch for. Yeah, I mean, as you say, he's he's going to push the ball down the field. He's going to turn it loose, and he'll also make some phenomenal throws. You may recall in that game he threw a touchdown to Njoku, um, which was kind of on a stick nod, which was as as good a throw against really good coverage as you'll see. Um, yes. So he's going to make throws, and at times 
you know, you know, Joe's belief, you know, having been in the league for a long time, and it's it's very simple for him is that if he sees man coverage or, or you know, it looks like man coverage, even if it's his own concept, but if it if it if it just appears to be one on one, he's going to throw the ball. Um, and, and that's just the way in which he plays. And again, we talked about Stroud working outside the numbers. Flacco has clearly expanded the Browns passing game, not only vertically, but horizontally as well. Because no that, question. Plus- that is open. Yeah. That's opened a whole new can for Amari Cooper, by the way. Right. Right. So, you know, especially with that plus split wide receiver to the field, now a factor, you know, it, it becomes a different and more difficult passing game to defend. Yes. Uh, don't expect the Browns to do much of the run game. That really hasn't been a feature since they lost Nick Chubb. The Texans have allowed 3.5 yards per carry this season. Only the Patriots have allowed less per carry at 3.3. Only the Browns, by the way, have more tackles for loss in the run game than Houston's 108. So maybe neither of these teams should expect to run the ball very well. And we'll just see an air show. We'll see how that works. Yeah, out. you know, and it's funny you say that because in that Week 16 game, Flacco was outstanding on play action. And mm-hmm. as you and I both know, you don't need to run the ball in order for play action to be effective. Please listen. Please clip this. Uh, our video guru, Chris Corder, please clip exactly what Greg said. We're going to make a separate video on just that. You don't need to run <laughs> play action. Please, God. Yes. Thank you. Anyway. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, you know, I think the, the Texans defense, we haven't talked about it a lot. Um, you know, their linebackers float to the ball. Well, it's very fundamentally sound as you'd expect from D'Amico Ryans and what Jim Schwartz is doing. My gosh. And I think Grant Delpit has been taken off injured reserve. So he might be available for this game. And, uh, just real quick detail. Cause we've talked about Delpit back when he was healthy, how important he is to that defense. If he can go. Yeah, Delpit's been a really good player for them when healthy. Um, you know, he's predominantly played closer to the line of scrimmage, not 100%, obviously, but he predominantly plays there because they're a, as you said, they're a single high foundational defense. Um, right. I think they've played as as many snaps of single high as any team in the league. So he's normally, he's normally closer to the line of scrimmage, which is where he's really, really good. Yep. Uh, so that's one interesting game on Saturday. The other one is Miami at Kansas City for all sorts. Oh, it's of only going to be minus six with a wind chill of twenty degrees. This reminds me of the week I was in uh, Minneapolis for the Super Bowl, and every time I went outside, it was like, uh, "Man, Midwest cold." I'm in Seattle. Midwest cold hits different. <laughs> Even East Coast cold, Midwest cold hits different. Uh, the Dolphins have an interesting new wrinkle. I'm sure you saw this in the run game. They showed on multiple plays against the Bills to great effect. Devon A. Chain, who did not play in the Week Nine game against the Chiefs, had three explosive runs in this concept. Tua out of pistol with A. Chain behind him would take a handoff to the left. A fake a handoff to the left to nobody. The target on each of those three fakes was linebacker Tyrell Dodson, and all three times Dodson had to respect the fake enough to slow his pursuit. It affected the run strength, and I guess these were fake counter pitches, for lack of a better term, but there was generally a tight end or, or fullback Alec Ingold as the lead blocker out of the backfield, and it was just one more of all the examples of how the Dolphins' use of eye candy in the run game can really mess your defense up. Now, the Chiefs have smart linebackers, and you know Spags will have a plan for this, but you know, especially with this weather, I think we need to talk about the two run games and how, I'll say it again, we don't talk about the Dolphins' run game, but in that 70-21 to 21 over the Broncos, they had 350 yards and five touchdowns on the ground. So that's a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, their run game foundation against the Bills was what you said. It was that pistol toss to HN, often with mister with a misdirection element. You know, you want to get him on the perimeter. You see the speed. Um, all you need to do, all they're trying to do with the misdirection element is just have those second level defenders just for a beat, you know, not, not be certain as to what the play is. And that's enough. That's enough for the blockers to get out and and get angles and leverage. And it's enough for HN to get, you know, on the perimeter. So, you know, that's what they're trying to do. I mean, they're running, it's funny, you know, their, their pass game, which I guess we won't know about pass games when it's six, six uh, below with 20, uh, uh, with wind chill minus 20 we won't know about that but you know the just in general their run game they try to get guys on the perimeter but their pass game works between the numbers it's kind of an interesting way that they play um but um uh you know i think talking about the run game look we've talked about this over the last two months or so the chiefs really foundationally what they've done well is run the ball and play good defense that's really been what the chiefs have been over the last two months Yes. 
Uh, so that's not only do you, <laughs> you don't need uh, play action to work with a good run game. You don't even need to have someone there to fake it to, because in all three of those explosive plays, two have faked it to nobody, and you still have to stop. It was pretty cool. Um, in that week nine game, Raheem Mostert ran 12 times for 85 yards and a touchdown. He had three explosive runs that were more standard run game concepts. Yep. But Mostert is a back who can be explosive at the second and third levels, and he leads the NFL with 18 rushing touchdowns. So again, you can run on this Chiefs defense to a point as good as it has been, and they have not seen a chain as as part of that structure. Um, so we'll see. Uh, on that yeah, side, I mean, everything seems to happen a little slower in that kind of weather. Um, sure. You know, one of the things with the Chiefs run game that they've done really well is the gap scheme runs. Um, yes. So I think we'll we'll obviously see that. Um, it's almost impossible. I mean, it is for me. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's almost impossible for me to get any sense of what pass games might, might look like when the wind chills 20, 20 below. I, I don't really have oh, any no. idea there. No, it was like that uh, Patriots-Bills game a few years back where Mac Jones threw like four Threw three balls. He threw three balls. Yeah. And they just, you know, demolished them with counter, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, 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 so that's really why I want to talk about, know that. Yeah. I want to talk about the run game. Isaiah Pacheco had 16 carries for 66 yards in that Miami game, no explosive runs, but sustaining, maybe he pops a couple against Miami's defense. Cause now they've got, uh, Oh, let's see. <laughs> they've just signed Justin Houston and Bruce Irvin and they already have Melvin Ingram, which is a good thing because Greg, if they didn't, I think you and I would be playing edge rusher for the dolphins uh, this weekend. I think yeah. So the question play. is, what do the Chiefs line up in? Because yeah. um, you mentioned edge rusher, but the Chiefs do line up a lot in multiple tight end personnel sets. They lead the league for the second year in a row in 13 personnel in the passing game. Yeah, so, so but I mean, just in general, just the what they line up in from a percentage standpoint, Doug, I mean, there's a lot of 12, there's a lot of 13. They run the ball out of that. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, now do you get the Dolphins in their base front, which is more of a 5-2, so it's not really an edge rush situation. So, you know, we'll see how this game plays out. I mean, this, like, I think we both agree it's hard to know about the pass game. You know, we could be, in an odd way, we could be looking at a 13-10 kind of game in which the pass game is not a big factor. You know, the other interesting thing with the Chiefs is, Clearly, their pass game hasn't been very good over the last couple of months, and Travis Kelsey has not really been a factor for quite some time now. No, he hasn't. Um, well, yeah, that was my point about Pacheco. He's a sustaining runner. Yeah. He pops a couple against that depleted defense, but the Chiefs may need him to because Pacheco can be a sustaining back. But what does that offense do around the sustaining plays? They're going to need more than five-yard runs and checkdowns against the blitz. Now, in the Miami-Buffalo game, as his pass rushers kept dropping and dropping, Vic Fangius are blitzing more and more. Vic sent six or more rushers on 103 plays in weeks one through 17 against the Bills in week 18. Miami sent six or more rushers on 14 plays. And against those packages, Josh Allen completed two or two of four passes for 43 yards, no touchdowns, and the interception to Eli Apple. Um, now, the book has been you never blitz Mahomes. With all the problems in their passing game, that's still true. Against six or more, 16 of 22 for 177 yards. 45 air yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, and a pass rating of 135.8. So I don't know that Vic will blitz. I think it it could be more – I mean, do they do the rush three, drop eight thing that the Bengals did? See if that works? I, I don't know. I mean, I think – I don't know only because I don't know until we see – what the past games could look like in that kind of weather. So, right. you know, it, it just might be different overall. I mean, I, I think both teams are not going to be certain about how they can play until they start playing. You can try to plan for that, but, and, and you're going to hear a lot of talk about, well, you know, Miami's not used to that weather. No one's used to 20 below. I don't care. I don't care where you live. No one's used to 20 below, uh, especially be out there playing football. So we'll see if the past games, you know, become a factor in the game. I mean, like I said, this could be run game based, defense based. Um, it, it's going to be hard. I mean, there's going it, to, it's going to be windy, you know, Tua, obviously a lot of Tua's throws are quick rhythm throws, but he certainly doesn't have a big arm. So it might, you know, any, any ball down the field might be difficult for him. Um, you know, obviously Mahomes has played in colder weather, but from what you read, this could be the coldest game ever played at Arrowhead stadium. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's just hard to discuss for me anyway, the, right. the past game and the tactics to, against it, it with, with the weather being what they're saying it's going to be. Yeah. My point with uh, 
with Pacheco is, yes, he sustains, but what can you build around that? I, I think the A dot in this game is going to be like four yards. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Not a lot. A lot of check downs. Uh, yeah. And, man, it could well be like that. It could well yeah. be like that. Because I don't know what else you're going to do. Um, Steelers at Bills. We made a decision just because of time and all the stuff we're discussing to pass on discussing this game in detail because Steelers Bills right now has the highest potential for I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. So just a <laughs> well, you do and you don't. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, the Steelers have to play a certain way on offense. Um, you know, they're going to try to run the football. Uh, that's what they've done the last three weeks with Mason Rudolph. Um, and then they try to, you know, throw it down the field here and there because he can push the ball down the field a little bit. Um, but, you know, that's the way they have to play. It, it can't be a Mason Rudolph game. Um, you know, and it can't be a YOLO Josh Allen game either, like the first quarter of that <laughs> week 18 game was. Well, I mean, Josh Allen's going to play like Josh Allen and people can discuss him all day long. Yeah. You know, the fact is, um, you know, obviously through the two picks, um, the second one, you know, we don't know what's in Josh Allen's head, but the second one could have him. It could have also have been him being smart. Fourth and two, he's not going to get a first down. Don't throw an incompletion or take a sack. You know, who knows? We don't know the answer to that. We don't know what's in his head. Uh, but then he settled into that game, Doug. And I mean, he was fourteen for fifteen in the second half. He only missed eight throws in the entire game. So, um, you know, and, and they got him into a rhythm. There were a lot of quick rhythm throws that that he made in that game. Um, you know, the Steelers defense, Watt's going to be out. They're hoping Fitzpatrick plays. You know, I guess we're talking on a Wednesday. We don't know the answer to that yet. They're hopeful. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the Bills, I think, are going to play the way the Bills play, and you're going to get Josh Allen. I mean, yep. could he throw a bad pick? Of course he could. This is the way in which he plays. But he also, you know, you get, got to the second half and fourth quarter of that game, and he was the driving force behind the Bills winning that game. Yep, and he'll throw, you know, one of those uh... – play and then he'll throw some just astronaut balls like nobody else in the league could do so that's right and then you also have the run game element with him i mean yep. at third and 13 where he ran for 15 yards i mean he's you know he's this is him you know i mean that's just the way it is you know and and people lose sight of the fact and i know everybody wants to talk super bowls and obviously he's not been there and he's not won one but you know they've won a lot of games since he's become the starting quarterback yep yeah, a lot of things can happen in the Super Bowl, so you just never know. <laughs> uh, Packers at Cowboys. Per next-gen stats, Jordan Love completed all seven of his play-action passes for 116 yards and a touchdown against the Bears in Week 18. He has thrown a league-high 912 yards off play-action since Week 9. Just one more re one more way in which he's killing it. I don't want to talk about Love or Dak Prescott in the Packers-Cowboys matchup because we've talked about them a lot. I want to talk about, and you brought this up on the phone yesterday, the Packers run game. Over the last three weeks, Greg, Aaron Jones has 63 carries for a league-high 359 yards, 5.7 yards per carry, and four runs at 15 or more yards. Only James Conner of the Cardinals has more, five. And Conner got to face the Eagles and Seahawks run defenses over the last two games, so I don't think that even counts. you got to put an asterisk on that one. But the 14-yard run against the Bears last week was a great example of how the Packers get Jones going. They had tight ends uh, Josiah DeGuara. Uh, from right to left, motioned him, and then tight end Tucker Kraft moved from the right side of the formation to de seal the left inside edge against linebacker T.J. Edwards. Left tackle Rasheed Walker kicked up to take linebacker Tremaine Edmonds. Yeah, he moved. Uh, he literally moved him 15 yards down the I field. I know, right? And then yeah, DeGuard yeah. took out Juan Brisker, the safety, and Romeo Dubs was busy keeping Tyreek Stevenson out of the play for a bit. Stevenson made the tackle. But, you know, we've talked about how much the, pack, the Packers are young. They're making us feel old because they have more players born in, the, in this uh, millennium than anyone else, which, gosh, ugh. Uh, but they're very on point with their blocking concepts for such a young team on that side of the ball. And when you watch the run game, you get a similar sense of just really good fundamentals from a team that is so young. We know about the passing game, but yeah. the Cowboys, and we'll get into the Cowboys in the run game in a second, they got to watch out for that because Aaron Jones is cooking with gas right now. Well, if you want to feel old, Doug, uh, Brad Stewart is 79 years old today. So if you I want know to feel all old. There's but, a lot but, of. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, but of anyway, that uh, yeah, that 14 yard run, which was on their first possession, um, that was basically a that was just a well designed counter misdirection concept. It was yeah. it was really kind of a cool play. But uh, but you made a point about Jones. I mean, he's had he ended the season with three consecutive games of 20 plus carries and 111 plus yards, and that's sort of been overlooked. Love though has played 
really excellent football. Um, yep. It's not a matter of talking about love, but it's a matter of, of, of talking about how they go about their, their pass game. Um, sure. Because they're going to face man coverage. So you're going to have to have man beaters in this game. And the other thing you're going to do is you're going to see a ton of motion. Uh, mm-hmm. Only two teams in the league have deployed motion more snaps than the Packers. So that's they're going to attack the man coverage that way. Um, I think the run game is important um, because the protection, you know, potentially could be an issue. Don't forget they're playing with a seventh round pick at left tackle and a fourth round pick at right tackle who mm-hmm. have held up okay. But yeah. – one thing about Walker at left tackle is he is very susceptible to speed to power, and he's going to face speed to power. Uh, yeah, that Micah Parsons guy can kind of do speed to power sort of well. <laughs> he's pretty good at that. Ouch. Uh, might be a lot of two, uh, you know, 12 and 13 personnel and just guys helping out, uh, I would think. Uh, but that run game, not a good news for Dallas defense. It has had its issues against the run. They're very light up front, and that issue has exacerbated itself since defensive tackle Jonathan Hankins suffered a high ankle sprain in Week 14. The good news is that Hankins was back on the field for the first time since that injury. Uh, he was on the field for the command against the Commanders in Week 18. Limited snaps, but he's a huge factor in Dan Quinn's defense. He allows Quinn to be far more creative with all his diamond light nickel stuff without worrying about the front four. So if he's back, you know, 80%, it, it gives a, a slightly different color to the game. Yeah, it could. Um, You know, I think that, um, you know, we know that the pass rush is really a strength of of what the Cowboys do. They play a ton of big nickel with three safeties. Um, You know, the the Packers do line up a lot in in 12 personnel and Musgrave is back now. I mean, they've got two really good tight ends in Musgrave and Kraft. Kraft has really come on with Musgrave being out for a good part of the season. Um, So they're going to line up in 12 personnel. Um, You know, Over the last, I mean, you know, again, this just gets back to love, but, you know, out of 12 personnel in the last eight games, he's been phenomenal. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how they feel they can best attack the Cowboys. What personnel package do they want the Cowboys in? We'll find that early in the game. Yeah, explosive plays out of heavy personnel. And Kraft, I love because he's a daredevil. He reminds me of Randy Cross's quote about Ronnie Lott. He doesn't care about your body or his body. Why should he care about yours? He kind of plays that way. Yeah, I mean, in the last three games, the Packers have played 44% of their offensive snaps at a 12 personnel. So, you know, and now Musgrave, you know, is truly back. Only played nine or 10 snaps last week. I imagine he'll be ready to play a lot more this week. So, you know, like I said, you know, so much is personnel based. What yep. personnel package do they want the Cowboys in? And then we'll find that out, you know, relatively early in the game. Yep. Uh, moving to Rams at Lions, and I don't know if I've been possessed by Chuck Knox, but I just want to talk a lot about run games. So let's talk about the Rams run game. They are so good, Greg, at using pre-snap motion to take their def- defense away from the run fits and keys. The timing and geometry are outstanding. They also use motion to steal the ed- seal the edge. The receivers and tight ends are good blockers. And the offensive line is aligned more expertly than you might think if you haven't been paying attention to the Rams' run game. Kyron Williams' 14-yard running into Ravens with 7.22 left in the fourth quarter in Week 14 was a really good example of that. This was duo, and we'll put the play up because it's really cool. Uh, Center Coleman Shelton and left guard Steve Avila, who's been really good as a rookie. Uh, Doubling defensive tackle Travis Jones. Right guard Kevin Dotson and right tackle Joseph Noteboom. Doubling defensive tackle Broderick Washington Jr. Then Shelton kicked up to steal Patrick Queen. Noteboom took Roquan Smith out. And Williams had a pretty easy gap against one of the NFL's best defenses. Um, no team has run more with motion than the Rams. I know we use two different stat services and yours says the Dolphins, but they're both way up there. Well, they both run a lot. Yeah, they both feature motion. Right. Here's what's changed given uh, Sean McVay's schematic history. How often they run some sort of gap blocking scheme this season. In 2020, they ran 17% gap. In 2021, 20%. In 2022, 29%. This year, 42%. They've become a gap team, Greg. And I I think that has a lot to do with what Kyron Williams prefers, but this happened before he got there. They're they're moving in a different direction. Yeah, but it does fit him well um, because he's he's not really an outside zone runner. I mean, you can think back to the days of Todd Gurley when he had those two or three great years. Um, Because Williams, you know, Williams is not an explosive back. He's a quick back. Um, he's a north-south guy. Um, he's kind of a no-nonsense runner. Um, you know, so so the gap scheme fits him better than outside zone, 
Um, so you see a lot of, you see gap scheme, you see duo, you know, these are the runs that they now feature because it really fits well. Um, and by the way, you said it was, it's not just him. It probably fit Cam Makers well in addition. And he oh, was true. really, he was kind of their feature back before Kyron yeah. Williams. Um, I could see that definitely. So, so, you know, this is what they moved to, which is smart football. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's like anything, you know, your pass game has to fit your quarterback, your run game fits your running back. So that's what they're doing because it really fits Kyron Williams. And obviously we know McVay believes in running the football as a, as a foundation of what he wants to get done offensively. We always think about the pass game because they do some really cool stuff, you know, with, with um, all the, the, the reduced splits, the stacks, the motions, um, you know, all the things they do, the bunches, but they, he wants to run the football. Yep. Lions have a very good run defense. They've allowed 3.7 yards per carry. Um, third best in the NFL behind the Patriots and the Texans. The Rams are in the middle of the pack. And the, the Lions also have a very good uh, run game with Ben Johnson and Jameer Gibbs and Montgomery. Uh, the Lions, a couple things you and I discussed on the phone. The Lions, who are now famous for tackle eligible issues, have used sixth offensive linemen a ton this season. They really went all out against the Vikings in week 18. You think of heavy personnel in the run game, but last week Jared Goff completed eight of nine passes with six offensive linemen on the field for 152 yards, 73 air yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and the highest possible passer rating of 158.3. His explosive plays out of 6 OL were completions of 34 and 70 yards to Amon Ross St. Brown against two different Vikings blitzes. The Rams have blitzed on 24% of their snaps this season, which ranks 16th in the league. They're more likely to get you a TT stunt with Aaron Donald and my defensive rookie of the year, Kobe Turner. They got Joe Flacco for a safety with one of those in week 12. So they're blitz, they're stunt, they're variable, they're versatile, but that's a matchup to watch with Aaron Donald and Kobe Turner and Byron Young and those guys. You know, they're they're one of the top pressure teams in the second half of the season against a Lions offensive line that's already good with five and gets really interesting with six, especially in the passing game. Yeah, I mean, this past week they played the Dan Skipper 17 snaps. It's the yep. most they played with six offensive linemen in any game. And as you said, they don't just run out of that. It's not meant just to be heavy, let's run it. They do throw out of it. Um, you know, it does afford you better protection, obviously, with a sixth offensive lineman. Um, and we'll see, you know, with Hawkinson, and Hawkinson, excuse me, with Laporta, Laporta, I, we have really haven't heard yet, but even Dan if he Campbell has said he's got an outside shot to play. So even if he does, he's not likely to play 50 snaps. No. Um, so I think you could continue to see that. Um, the other factor there is to Mitchell, who's their second tight end. He actually has a lot of ability. Now, I'm not going to say he's Laporta, but he actually has a lot of ability and he can run. Because I remember watching him at Virginia Tech and he had gotten hurt there as well, which kind of short circuited his career in college. But he, he runs really well. So. You know, I don't think it'll change what they do. It may change who Goff looks to in certain situations, but I don't think it will change tactically how they approach their offense. Whoever Goff looks to, Greg, they're going to use under center play action. We know this. Uh, uh, he, that we do. That uh, we Jared do. Jared Goff has 135 dropbacks with under center play action this season. He's completed 92, 130 for 1258, 588 yards, seven touchdowns, one interception, and pass rating of 116.1. The guy who ranks second in dropbacks with under center play action, Greg, Matthew Stafford. We're going to see a lot of this in this game. Can you explain quickly the differences for quarterbacks and why some might be more adept with under center? Obviously, you have to turn your head and turn it back around, but why well, some quarterbacks thrive with this and both quarterbacks in this game especially do? There's a couple of things. Number one, I, I personally, uh, from you know watching tape for a lot of years, I'm more a believer in under center play action for a couple of reasons, but, but we'll get to the quarterback in a sec. It takes longer to get to the mesh point, the mesh point being where you show the ball to the running back, where the actual fake point. It takes longer to get there with under center play action than it does with shotgun play action. So therefore, there's more uncertainty for second level defenders and even deeper defenders who yeah. many of them have their eyes in the backfield to see what's going on back there. So it just creates a longer period of time before they know exactly what the play is. And another point that's never really made, but it's a really, it's true. And then McVay understood this exceptionally well. If you have outside zone run action, mm -hmm. your D line in response to that, their initial move is lateral, not vertical to the quarterback. Okay. So, 
So think about that. That means they're not rushing the quarterback right off the snap of the ball. They're moving laterally in response to outside zone run action. So it gives the quarterback a little more time to be secure in the pocket because normally with under center play action, you have deeper routes. Now, when I say deeper, I don't mean vertical, you know, 60 yard throws, but you you need your receivers to kind of work their routes a little bit more. So you need your quarterback to be secure in the pocket. And you brought up a really good point. It's And I think it's one reason why a lot of younger quarterbacks, don't forget, Goff technically is a veteran quarterback who's been in the league a while. Stafford is a veteran quarterback. A lot of younger quarterbacks, they've never, ever turned their back to the defense. Because now with all the way you know uh, quarterbacks are taught starting when they're nine or ten years old with all the seven and sevens, everything is shotgun, everything yep. is one-step drops. You know, they don't turn their back to the defense. Like that's a learned trait because if you've never turned your back to the defense, that's a little scary because the defense will not be in the same spot as after you turn your head around as they were before you turned your head around. And if you've never done that before, now all of a sudden you have, you know, a fraction of a beat to pick up what the new look is. Now you can anticipate based on film study. Oh, here's what's going to happen. But you know, you've got to confirm and validate that. And if you've never done that before, that's a whole different deal. Well, imagine in the last five years or so, you're a, you, you're coming into the NFL from whatever college program you played in. And I would say over the last five years, I don't know if you agree over the last five years, I would say the disguise and late movement in secondaries has expanded exponentially. Expanded greatly. It's, it's a lot more. Now. Yes, yes. So maybe 10 years ago, you could turn your back and turn. Now it's like, geez, what am I going to see when I turn my head? I right. Have no idea. There's a lot more uncertainty just in the way defensive coordinators are it's not muddying the picture it's changing the picture it's like it's like an optical illusion you're flipping the script right so if you turn your head you turn it back i mean you you have to take certainty out the window because you have no idea you know and 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 like we said it's not like you and i you know i can sit with my clicker and watch a play 10 times quarterback has a fraction of a beat of a second to to see it or it's too late so you know a lot of quarterbacks most coming into the league do not number one they've never done it and, you know, now you're learning something at the, at the NFL level and coaches would have to feel comfortable calling it because, you know, you know, it's all trust with coaches. So, you know, you're dealing with two, uh, I don't want to say grizzled veterans, but I guess they are in Goff and Stafford who have grown up playing quarterback with conventional play action, meaning they're under center, turning their back to the defense. I mean, Goff literally... I mean, my numbers are slightly different than yours. You know, it could just be, you know, a different website. But I have 143 of 159 dropbacks, play action dropbacks for Goff have come with him under center. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> I always say uh, minus plus or minus 10 percent with any of these charting. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's great work, but there's a lot to cover. That's a foundation of their pass game yeah. of their offense, basically. Yes. Um, and that, yeah. And I, I think when you're a veteran like Goff and Stafford, they have more confidence and more just, you know, faith in the receiver concepts. If you're coming in right from college, you don't know your receivers yet. So you don't, okay. If I throw the, you know, if I throw the, the dig to Puka, he's got it. I don't care what the coverage is, but if you're coming in from college, you don't know your receivers that much more than, you know, the defenses. So well, and it's also a function of, what, what a lot of coaches call functional knowledge. Mm-hmm. When you're a quarterback, you, you're not reading five guys. You no. can't. It's not humanly possible. So guys who've done this have a better understanding that, hey, I know my route combination. So when I do turn my head around, the, this these are the one or two guys I really need to pick up. I don't need to pick up, you know, five guys because you can't. So they, they have just a clearer sense because if you've never done, done a lot of this stuff, when you turn around, you just see a mass of people. And if mm-hmm. you don't have a sense of, OK, this is who I really need to see, like, you know, then then it just what you. I remember Jaws telling me that when you drop back, there were just some plays where you drop back and you see everything, but you're really seeing nothing. And mm-hmm. I think that's what happens a lot with with young quarterbacks is they drop back and they see it all but it's just a mass of bodies. There's no definition to what they're seeing. Well, yeah. When I was learning to watch tape, I, <laughs> I now I can, I'm a lot better just because I've done it for a long time. I've had people like you to, to teach me how to watch tape. Um, at first it was just a big amalgam of stuff like right. going on here. And over time, Oh, I can isolate it to five 
and three and then one and then with the one okay now i'm actually getting the coverage right as opposed to last year when i didn't you know I didn't and that's know. why i use the term with quarterbacks and i know it's the same as processing but you know years ago i just thought of it in terms of elimination and isolation yep. that's what a quarterback has to do they have to eliminate what's not there and then isolate where they want to go with the ball within the timing and structure of the play design that's what you're really trying to do you know it, it there's a lot of elimination the great quarterbacks and this is why there's a lot more and, and i love these sort of tangents we go off on i know there's other games but that's why um there's a lot more late coverage rotation because yes. you're trying to minimize what the great quarterbacks can do before the snap of the ball because the great ones the brady's the breeze the guys who've retired the mannings you know they pretty much uh, dissected your defense before the snap of the ball you know so all they were doing was validating when they took the snap they knew exactly what it looked like we have young quarterbacks who are surprisingly i think purdy is surprisingly advanced so at stroud Purdy's phenomenal at it stroud some guys really, coming at it. Up are really in their first and second years dialing that up and doing it and right and right. that's a hard trait to see you know you watch college uh, you do college evaluations as i've done for years that you don't really see that in college that's why the trait that purdy has it's one reason why he's become so good so fast you know when you watch the big 12 you're not seeing you know late coverage rotation so you didn't no. know that purdy had this trait until he got to the nfl yeah you didn't see it with stroud oh the georgia game was a revelation well yeah it was for a lot of reasons but you know i, I digress um yeah and by the way when you turn their back and turn it back around micah parsons and tj watt and miles garrett and uh, Chris Jones, those guys can cover a lot of ground in the time it takes you to turn your back and then turn around. So it gets a little scary back there. Yeah, it's not comfortable turning your away from everybody on the field. Yeah, you have a lot, a lot of faith. Um, yeah. So final game, I think we went on that tangent just so you could delay talking about the Eagles, but we have to go there, Greg. Eagles at Buccaneers. Well, <laughs> it's a very interesting tactical game. Yes. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we people are, are down on the Eagles and, and, you know, they've not played well for many reasons. We're not going to get into all their issues. We're going to talk about it in the context of this game. Yes. And one of the things that I think is really going to stand out is you and I both know Todd Bowles is a heavy blitzer. Okay. Yes. And he's been doing that for years. Shoot. I can remember sitting in my office with Ron Jaworski, you know, going back to 2007, 2008, when he was the Dolphins defensive coordinator and watching him do what we would call triple A gap blitzes with safety. Jeremiah Bell. I remember, you know, oh, yeah, I remember. seven, you yep. know, and, and he still does those kinds of things. And, and they're going to attack the Eagles offense. The Eagles have struggled with pressure. Um, this week was, was a bad outing for Jalen Hurts mentally. I mean, yeah. You know, it is incumbent upon the quarterback, even if he's not calling the protections. Now, every quarterback can override a center, by the way. You know, right. very often centers are given the task of calling protections. Um, but quarterbacks can override that if they see something. Um, mm -hmm. But he just didn't, you know, it, it's incumbent upon the quarterback to understand fronts and pressures and coverage. He's got to understand that. And for whatever reason, this week, Hertz was just did not see it the right way. And that's on tape. And we know the Bucks blitz. I believe 15 or 16 of their 48 sacks have come from non-defensive linemen. So you're going to see White Blitz. You're going to see David Blitz. You're going to see I have 25 blitz. Like five sacks from the linebackers and DBs this season. Yeah, you're going to see Neil Blitz. You're going to see I mean Winfield is a really good blitzer. Can and we talk about him, him for a minute? Because outside of Kyle Hamilton, I don't think there's a better safety in the NFL. There might not be. I mean, he's he's multi-dimensional. He's like Hamilton, he's everywhere. What they do a great job with with their pressures, Doug, is they attack gaps. So in other words, yeah. I mentioned the triple A gap. They'll they'll send two or three in the A gap. They'll mm -hmm. send two or in the B gap. They attack gaps, and they do such a good job with that. So you you know, uh, Hertz and the O line. It's the O line as well. Uh, they have to be aware of where people are. But don't forget, you know, Jason Kelsey. You know, if he's calling protection, then he then he puts his head down. He's not going to see Winfield twelve yards from the line of scrimmage. No. You know, no. so. You know, that's where your quarterback, it's incumbent upon him to see all that and recognize that and, if necessary, override the protection call. Yeah, they have uh, Christian Isian, the uh, rookie slot corner. The rookie free agent from Rutgers who's been their yeah. slot pretty much all year. And he get, he's really good on those delayed blitzes. Well, the, the problem with the Buccaneers, if you're a quarterback, it's not just that they blitz so much. 40.1% uh, of their snaps, which is the third highest in the league behind the Vikings and the Giants. No surprise there. But in week three, the Bucks blitz Hurts on 22 of his 37 dropbacks, 
Hertz completed 13 of 21 for 152 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions, pass rating of 44.2. Now, 16 of those blitzes get muddy because Tampa Bay will run some five-man base fronts, but there were enough snaps of the four-man front and a blitzer for that to, you know, you can kind of separate if you watch every play right. one to another. But they would send Levante David and Devin White on edge blitzes from the second level. Uh, at times, those looks were to contain the edge. They were kind of mush rushing with the blitz. So it's it's yes, they blitz a lot, and yes, they blitz different guys, but they also use different concepts. And even I mean, I would not call a mush rush a blitz, Greg. I would say in in that case, you're you're containing gaps as opposed to a blitz. To me, is you are arraying five or more defenders against the quarterback. That's not what this was a lot of the time. So with Bowles, it's not just that he's throwing you a lot of pitches, but he's got the fastball, he's got the circle change, he's got right. the slider. He will throw everything at you. That's tough. Yeah, and, and you know, week three, the Eagles were obviously playing a lot better football and offense than they are now, although they did struggle in that game. Um, yes, they did. You know, so uh, we'll see. You know, they've not played well. They've not handled pressure well. Um, and, uh, you know, this – obviously, we're in the playoffs, so it's a clean slate. But, you know, the, the track record the last number of weeks has not been good at all in terms of handling pressure. I found one play interesting. Hertz's interception to Devin White with 48 seconds left in the first half in week three. They had David White mugged up in the B gaps. Uh, it was a B gap mug, not like right over the center. Uh, Vita Vea was at nose. Both linebackers dropped out in cover three. Rookie cornerback uh, Christian Isian, is it Isian? I'm sorry. I so. uh, got through on a delayed blitz from outside. Hertz attempted a quick Texas route to DeAndre Swift. Hertz threw it behind where Swift was going. The timing of the route was so off, it looked like White was like, it looks like he was throwing to White and he had to wait for Swift to clear out. That was not a good play, Greg. That was bad. No, I mean, and, and the thing is, if he had if he had hit uh Swift in stride, he might have scored. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a bad throw by by Hertz. But um, you know, so that side of the ball is interesting. And the other side is too, because the Eagles on defense, you know, it's it's we've we've discussed their their issues. Uh, you know, they haven't been able to rush the quarterback. They don't cover particularly well. They've gotten old in the secondary real fast. Now, I guess Slay is supposed to be back this week. Um, in the week three game, starting sort of late second quarter, they started to match him up to Evans. Um, well, I would imagine they would continue to do that because uh, they really don't have anybody else that I would think they'd feel comfortable with. My guess is you'll see the Eagles play a lot of zone coverage in this game because what they've been doing, they've been playing dime a lot more under Patricia than they did under Desai. And in their dime, the outside corners have been Ricks and Ringo. Now, if Slay's back, but still they're going to have a rookie at one of the outside corners because Bradbury moves inside because, quite frankly, based on the tape, he can't cover outside anymore. Couple notes. Uh, because the Eagles secondary is slow, I have two words for you. Trey Palmer. Watch out for that guy because he's kind of the vertical dude now. Well, he can run. And and the good yeah. thing about that for them is he can also be used to lift coverage and create yes. more space, even yep. if he's not the primary receiver. Eagles were 29th in pass defense EVA in the first half of the season. They're 29th in the second half of the season, so consistency. They plummeted from 4th to 31st in run defense DVOA in the second half of the season. Most of that came against the Cardinals, I think. And Tampa Bay's run game isn't quite that, but Rashad White can be explosive. He's, You'll just have to watch out for that. And the Buccaneers, Greg, they use a lot of 12 personnel when they run, and because they also throw a lot of uh, throw a lot of 12 personnel, you can't really keep – Dave Canales, their OC, has done a really good job of sort of – making things muddy out of heavy personnel, which, you know, Kyle Shanahan does, McDaniel does, a few coaches at LaFleur does that, we talked about before. So they're tying their run game and pass game together with heavier personnel. That's not a great matchup for this defense because I've seen a lot of missed keys, especially in coverage. Um, I refer back to Wandale Robinson's 33-yard catch with 11 minutes left in the first quarter where he got wide ass open on that slot crosser. And I'm bringing this up because Chris Godwin can beat you to death on stuff like that. Mike Evans is his own problem, but you know, the, and I, I, I mentioned in my notes, do the Eagles have the speed to deal with Trey Palmer when they're, I don't think so. So I, I, this is, this is, this could be brutal. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, the Eagles have really struggled with past defense. I mean, that 33 yarder, you know, the, They've really struggled with guys you would expect to be able to see things the right way and play with the proper discipline have not played that way. No. And, 
you know, combine that with guys getting old with a little bit, uh, you know, less talent than maybe we all expected going into the season, and their their defense has just not been very good at all. I mean, that 33-yarder to Robinson was, you know, I mean, I know exactly what happened on the play, but but the point is, is that's just a good example of just, you know, not not playing your with the discipline that's necessary. Yeah. Can you summarize that real quick and then we'll uh, bow out? Well, what, what they did, the Giants were in, a, were in an 11 personnel, a two by two set. Um, the Eagles were in what they they're in a lot of. They're a five man front um, conventional nickel, meaning five DBs. And Morrow was the only linebacker. OK, right. so they ended up rushing five. Uh, Bayard was the fifth rusher. So what they did is it became three underneath, three deep because by a rush. So now they only have six in coverage. But the thing is, Sweat's on the line of scrimmage. He's not a, he's not a second level defender. He's on the line of scrimmage. So mm-hmm. the rules change. You know, a lot of times if you have a second level defender, they're trying to match, you know, who's who's number three. Who's number two? You know, they try to match by where players are aligned. But when you're on the line of scrimmage, Doug, Sweat has no idea what number two is doing. Number two is Robinson, by the way, on this right. play, because Barkley was number three offset in the backfield. So he has no idea what number two is doing. You know, number two could could run, run a wheel route. I mean, he has no idea. So, so he stays with three. Barkley ends up releasing and he's thinking oh my god he could want to run a wheel route i got to get on my horse i got to run with him because you know i don't know what two's doing so i don't know so maddox immediately went with barkley which i don't understand because you can't do that so right. therefore you know robinson just ran the slant and no one was there oops yeah uh real quick nick sirianni was asked this week is it a patricia problem and he said well it's not we didn't take everything Matt wanted to do. We sort of merged it with what we were doing before. And that's hard to do during the season. Yeah, it's like, ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff to put in when you can't even really hit anybody. You can't practice a lot. Yeah. What are we doing here? I don't know. But anyway. and, you, and, and, and look, the reality of life is with the collective bargaining agreement. I'm not making a judgment. It's just the no. reality of life is, what it is you can't practice like that. So it's all it's a lot of classroom work. It's a lot of walking through things, which is a lot different than when it happens in the game. It's a lot of stuff on paper, and as they say, we don't play the games on paper, Greg. But what we do do is thank you, as always, for your great insight and understanding of the football game. Uh, Super Wild Card Weekend, and we'll be back to talk more X's and O's for the divisional frame next week.